Welcome to the White House Virtual Town Hall on Disability Issues. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're very excited to be hosting uh, this first White House Town Hall on Disability Issues. My name is Kareem Dale, and I'm Special Assistant to the President for Disability Policy here at the White House. I work in the Office of Public Engagement, which is Valerie Jarrett's office, handling outreach to the disability community. I also work in the Domestic Policy Council, which is Melody Barnes' office, coordinating the administration's policy on disability issues, along with my colleague, who you're going to hear from in a second. So we're going to introduce ourselves, tell you a little bit about us, and then we're going to jump into the many questions we have received online and that some of you all may email to us live here today. So thanks again for joining us, and let me turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Crowley, to introduce himself. Thank you, Kareem. Hello, everybody. As Kareem said, I'm Jeff Crawley, and I'm the Senior Advisor on Disability Policy in the White House, D Domestic Policy Council. I'm also the Director of the Office of National AIDS Policy. So in the work that Kareem and I do together, I'm our lead on health policy issues. I actually have, um, my background is in um, Medicaid and Medicare policies, which we know are um, big issues for, for people with disabilities. But we um, sort of coordinate the broad disability agenda together for the present. Yep. My name is Rebecca Copley. I am the Director of Priority Placement for Public Engagement in the Office of Presidential Personnel here at the White House. Um, our job is creating an administration that reflects the diversity of America, and this president operates off of an extremely wide and broad definition of diversity. So we're out there finding the best and the brightest around the country to come and serve the president. And my name is Sarah Feuerstein. I'm Kareem Dale's assistant in the Office of Public Engagement. I help him with disability outreach. Thank you very much, everybody. So, you know, we felt like the best approach today was to give you a brief introduction about us, but really to spend the majority of the time answering your questions and, and hearing from you and trying to address the issues that many of you raise. Unfortunately, we received, uh, we received so many questions, or I should say fortunately, because we're very happy people were engaged. We won't be able to answer all of the questions we received um, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe a thousand questions. So. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're certainly going to tr try to address a broad range of issues from a broad spectrum of persons from around the country. And Sarah, who you just heard from, is going to be moderating and reading the questions, and Jeff, Becca, and I will be answering the questions. We also have the ability to accept questions live today, and you can do that by emailing us at disability at who.eop.gov. That's disability at who.eop.gov. So let me turn it over to Sarah to start with the questions. Okay, um, our first question, there's actually two questions and they're related. The first one comes from Frank in Royal Oak, Michigan, who says, what is the administration's position on funding for disability related initiatives as we move forward? It is clear that the current political position on one side stresses reductions in support for those in need. If cuts to entitlements occur, Many currently underserviced individuals will suffer even more. What is the vision of the president for assisting those with disabilities? And uh, the related question also from Carrie in Marshall, Minnesota. I've heard discussions that legislature wants to eliminate programs that help those with disabilities be independent as possible in the community, thus forcing people into group homes, nursing homes, and institutions. What are your thoughts and feelings regarding this issue? Should Should I start? Take that? I'll start, and Kareem, you might want to add. So you know, it's, it's clear that our country is facing uh, very serious financial challenges. And um, the President believes we need to address them, both to um, come up with um, short-term solutions and long-term solutions. I think he believes that the way we'll get to um, a, a more um, stable and secure future for people with disabilities and others is if we really tackle the, the tough choices. And I think he's said that he's um, willing to put all issues on the table and address them fairly. He's also said he's looking for a balanced approach, though. So in, in particular with relation to the, the key health care programs, he said he's not going to allow Medicare to be fundamentally changed, so it's no longer um, the same program that we know it today. He said he's not going to allow Medicaid to be block granted, and so it um, can't meet um, its important role in serving people with disabilities and others. As, as you know if you read the news, there's a lot of talk going on about uh, the negotiations, different things that are being said. I think the President is trying, though, to, to again, find a balanced approach so that these programs will be stable. Since the beginning of his administration, though, we faced difficult fiscal choices, and he's proven his commitment to, to people with disabilities. He worked hard to enact the Affordable Care Act, which gives us a long-term solution that will really greatly expand access to insurance coverage, but also do many things along the way to make our, our health system work more efficiently for all Americans, 
but including people with disabilities. So I think he has a long-term vision is trying to get there. But as he um, faces the, these immediate challenges around um, the debt ceiling and other conversations, he's really looking for a balanced approach. And he's, he's willing to take a free and open look at all of the issues on the table so that we can hopefully move, move forward together as all Americans. And Kareem, did you want to add to that? I think the, the only thing I would add is that I think what the president is talking about is there's a fundamental choice here. Uh, both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, all want to reduce the deficit, and that's the goal. And the fundamental choice is between how we do that. And what we've seen from the Republican plan is that they want to reduce the deficit and they want to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires and folks like the president um, who make lots of money. And the choice there is that with the president's plan, what we don't want to do is to um, make, have those tax breaks and also turn Medicaid into a dramatically underfunded block grant. And that's the choice. And the president wants to find a good, balanced approach where everybody has to sacrifice a lot, but we're not going to do that on the backs of people with disabilities while tax breaks are going to millionaires and billionaires and corporate jet owners. Thank you very much for those questions. Sarah? Okay. Our next question comes from David in Crowley, Texas. Um, he wants to know, what are we, the United States, doing to slow down the rate of autism in America? Sure, I'll start. You know, so autism is a, a condition that really exists on a spectrum. So there's, there's um, broad diversity of severity and, and the way it, it affects individuals. You know, a couple decades ago, it was considered a, a very rare condition, but our, our latest um, data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is about um, one in a, every 110 children are um, on the autism spectrum. Um, so, so it's, it's a growing problem. So there's a number of things that we're trying to do. A big focus across the federal government is really to um, diagnose children earlier. So I think some studies have suggested the mean age of diagnosis is around four years old, but the goal is to really diagnose as soon as possible, maybe around 14 months of age, we really should be able to, to get a target so we're identifying people. Um, CDC and HRSA are, are doing, um, have work together, again, to educate providers and community members to help, help us achieve that goal. The Rehabilitation Services Administration at the Department of Education and SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, that's in HHS, has uh, developed a supported employment toolkit to better support um, people with autism who are, who are seeking employment. Um, and then, not lastly, but another big program I want to mention is Medicaid. You know, it is the, the cornerstone for uh, our healthcare safety net for people with disabilities. And there's a number of ways that state Medicaid programs um, provide services to children and adults with disabilities. This is a program where many states, in fact, the vast majority have waivers where they expand Medicaid to cover people with um, developmental disabilities, including autism. So again, our, I think our government's response is to recognize that autism seems to have increased and certainly our knowledge of it's increased. We want to uh, diagnose people earlier, and then we need to look for um, multiple responses to, to meet the needs of individuals and families with autism. And I, I have two things to that. Uh, the first is, uh, as an administration, as the White House, we've, we've done a lot to try to bring stakeholders together, researchers, people in the education field and the employment field, to talk about these issues. And just this past April, um, in celebration or in, in observance of World Autism Awareness Month. We brought in about 100 uh, research professionals, scientists, people in the employment field, education, to meet with senior folks in the administration. We had Deputy Secretary of Labor, we had the Deputy Secretary of uh, the Department of Education, the Secretary of HHS, Kathleen Sebelius, all participated in this event uh, that went part of the day, about half of the day. And we talked, we had breakout sessions and remarks. And so that was an effort, that was an effort to bring together and make sure we are exchanging ideas and talking about how the government can do better on these issues and how the community itself can continue to work together. And the only other thing I would say is that in that event, we certainly announced and we've made public that the president supports um, the reauthorization of the Combating Autism Act. And I know that there's uh, different pieces of legislation out there and different views and, and different um, ideas about that. And we're working with Congress and we're working with the Department of Health and Human Services to come up with the right solution for, every, for everybody. And, but the bottom line is that overall, we want this to be, we want, we want the act to be reauthorized and we want to work towards that goal to continue to improve the research um, and also community supports for those on the autism spectrum. Okay. Sir. Our next question comes from Jay in Ohio. 
Why must disabled people live by rules concocted by non-disabled people who lack clue about our needs? Thank you for the question, Jay. And it's a good question. And it's, um, it's that old, uh, the, the old saying that uh, you hear in the disability community, uh, nothing about us without us. And when I saw this question, I thought, well, this is a really good question uh, to emphasize the Obama administration's perspective on the way uh, the president believes that we should make sure that uh, it is a reflection of the entire community. And so here in the White House, uh, I have a disability. I'm blind. And uh, Becca also lives with a disability. And we have many people with disabilities across the federal government that are working on these issues. We have Deputy Director of the Office of Personnel Management, Chris Griffin. We have Assistant Secretary Kathleen Martinez at the Department of Labor. Who, all, who have disabilities and many others. And so that combination of people with disabilities and also people without disabilities, making sure that we are working together and have a diverse perspective. Um, you know, Jeff is my colleague and, and, and Becca's colleague and we work well together and, and Jeff has been working on disability issues for many years and cares about those issues just like everybody else. And so we, make, we wanna make sure that people with disabilities are there when the decisions are being made and that's the case in the Obama administration. I don't, Becca, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, you know, just as just as the disability community's mantra is nothing about us without us, I think, you know, our our president really believes that people are policy. It really does matter who's at the table. And having the right people at the right tables at the right times when those decisions are made is critical for all of, all of the American people. And I can honestly say that there isn't a piece of public policy or, or a public policy area within the administration that isn't being impacted by the voices of people with disabilities in this administration. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Our next question comes from Tiffany in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, she says, I am a small business owner and I'm very interested in hiring a person with a disability. Are there programs available to assist in small business um, in successfully hiring potential employees with disabilities? Yes, there are tons of programs. and. Um, it's, it, there, there are lots of programs, there are lots of avenues where you can find qualified people with disabilities. And, I, and I'll name a few, and uh, Jeff and Becca may want to add uh, anything from their perspective. But uh, the, the, you know, a couple of programs that I'll start with, obviously, the Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Voc Rehab, in your state, it may be called the State Department of Rehabilitation Services. They are responsible for their clients or people uh, with significant and people with the most significant disabilities and helping them find job opportunities. So you can connect with your local Department of Rehabilitation Services and say, hey, I want to find qualified people with disabilities to hire. Um, you can work through the WRP, the Workforce Recruitment Program, and look for candidates uh, with disabilities. There are organizations out there uh, that are doing good work on trying to hire young people with disabilities, whether it's uh, uh, college students with disabilities or young professionals with disabilities. Um, there's also the Office of Disability Employment Policy, uh, which also works to connect people with disabilities uh, throughout the country to good jobs and you can go on the Department of Labor's website and look at the Office of Disability Employment Policies website and look for qualified candidates with disabilities. So, th so th those are just a few but there are many more um, you know in this day and age where you have Google uh, if you just Google hey, hire people with disabilities you'll find different companies that do it you'll you'll find all types of services for, fi for finding qualified candidates and we certainly thank you for the question because uh, hiring people with disabilities is certainly a focus of this president and administration. Now, Becca, Jeff, you want to add anything? I think you got it. No, I think you okay. covered it. <laughs> right. Okay, our next question comes from Richard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He says, Giving, given the continuing unemployment rates, what can the federal government do to help ensure individuals with disabilities are not the last group to have their employment prospects improved as the economy slowly recovers? Well, I'll add some, but Becca, you want to start with what we're doing in terms of political appointments on that, and then maybe I can add just broad spectrum? Definitely, definitely. You know, as I said earlier, people are policy. It really matters who's at the table. But we can't put people at the table if we don't have people in our system to find and place in political appointments throughout the Obama administration. So I continue to strongly encourage candidates or interested people um, to go to the whitehouse.gov homepage and click on apply for a job. It's kind of hard to see, it's at the bottom of the page and it's in gray typeface on a white background. 
um, but it is there, and apply. And we use that database on a daily basis. There are over 200,000 resumes in there, and I must use that at least 10 to 15 times a day as I pull together candidates for jobs in the administration. One of the other things that I would really strongly encourage you to do is, you know, Focus your resume on skill sets. I think for any job, let alone you know working within the federal government, we have a number of people with disabilities that are very passionate about working on disability issues. Um, you know that's wonderful, and we need people that are advocates. But we also need scientists. We need managers. We need engineers. You know those of you who feel that to be a, a political appointee with a disability you need to have a background in, in advocacy and, and activism. We need scientists just as bad, if not more so. We need doctors. You know we have over 300 boards and commissions that are presidentially appointed, and these are great ways to participate in the work of the federal government and the work of this administration without leaving the comfort of your home. You know except for maybe three or four times a year and being able to participate in conference calls and the like. These are huge opportunities. So I would tell you, you know, definitely make sure we have your resume on whitehouse.gov. I would also encourage you, we have an email box um, that I'll give out right now, actually, for those interested in getting your resume directly to me. Um, and I would ask that you put White House Town Hall in the subject line. That email address is Presidential Personnel Office, P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T-I-A-L. P-E-R-S-O-N-N-E-L-O-F-F-I-C-E -E at who.eop.gov, and it'll get us your resume. That's a long email, yeah. that's record. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for that. I, the, the other thing that I would say in terms of, obviously Becca deals with the, the political appointments, and then there's a vast array of career uh, career positions within the federal government as well as in the then you deal with positions in the private sector let me let me first talk about the federal government career uh, I've, in 2009 uh, for the first time in history the Department of Labor began calculating the monthly unemployment rate for people with disabilities and that's obviously critical the first thing in order to help improve employment for people with disabilities we have to be on the map and we have to be counted and we have to be there you know and being, uh, knowing what's going on in the community. And so that was the first huge step in 2009 after the president took office. And then, so from that, we begin to work on and look at policies that can help improve employment with disabilities. And I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest policies that we've done in the employment arena in the federal government for people with disabilities is the president signing the executive order last year to hire uh, 100,000 persons within five years and really make the federal government a model employer for people with disabilities. And listen, you're challenging economic times and it's, it's difficult times um, for hiring overall, it's a difficult time for the economy, uh, but what we've said is that if we're gonna be doing hiring, people with disabilities must be a part of that. And so we've worked very hard with the Office of Personnel Management, the Department of Labor, and all of our federal agencies uh, to develop the plans uh, that will help us reach these goals. And the agencies have submitted those plans and working very hard with a number of different resources. Some of the ones I mentioned earlier, Voc Rehab, WRP, and other programs that we work in, in the federal government to increase the hiring of people with disabilities. And so in the federal sector, we're trying to lead the way and trying to make the federal government a model employer. And we hope to continue to work on that uh, in the years to come and to improve the hiring and the overall focus of the administration in each and every agency. This is not an easy problem. If it was easy, it would have been fixed uh, a long time ago. And so, but we're going to continue to work on it and work very hard on it. We have a team of dedicated folks who are working on it on a daily basis. The other thing is obviously in the private sector. And I think we're doing a number of things, but I think the biggest thing is that the president is trying to lead by example. With signing that executive order, it obviously receives a lot of coverage in the private sector, and we're talking to private sector entities. Our Office of Disability Employment Policy, for example, and Secretary Solis and the Department of Labor have gone out and they've had sec what they call sector events. And so they've done an event in the healthcare sector, they've done an event in the entertainment slash media sector, and they have another event coming up in the financial sector in the next month or so where they are bringing together individuals and leaders in these different sectors. And Secretary Solis is there. 
I'm there, Assistant Secretary Kathleen Martinez is there, talking about employment in these sectors and how they can increase employment and it brings together maybe 100 to 200 persons who are leaders in employment in that sector. And so we're trying to talk about how can we improve that and increase the numbers because hiring is the ultimate goal. And as Secretary Salih says, good jobs for everyone uh, is the goal. So th those are some of the things that we're doing. I think we're doing a lot more. But those are some of the major initiatives that we have going related to employment. And I think uh, if we get some other questions, we'll expand on some of the other things that we're doing. Okay. The next question is from Thomas in Cincinnati, Ohio. What is the Obama administration doing to ensure adequate enforcement of Title III of the ADA, requiring that places of public accommodation are made accessible to the disabled? I think I think that the, the uh, we're doing a couple of things related to uh, accessibility of different locations and different facilities. I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things and um, over various titles of the ADA. And the, the first thing I want to talk about, because the Department of Justice is, is doing such a good job, is uh, Project Civic Access, which deals with obviously looking at cities and towns across the country and making sure that they are accessible, that they, the public facilities in cities and towns across the country, the local and state government facilities are accessible. And the, the Department of Justice has worked very hard and they've announced a number of different settlements with cities and states uh, throughout the country since we took office where the cities and states are going to make sure uh, that their public facilities uh, are accessible and that people with disabilities have the right to, uh, the right and the ability to use the parks, uh, to use the city buildings, uh, and to use the other local uh, facilities that are that are open to uh, the public and so that's one uh, big initiative and I think on a, on a broader sense the Department of Justice has continued to be aggressive to make sure that where we see discrimination and where we see people with disabilities not having access uh, whether it be in the educational facility where the department has announced a number of different settlements uh, where uh, folks on the autism spectrum or with other developmental disabilities uh, weren't allowed the proper accommodations, the Department of Justice has gone after those and, and obtained settlements. Or uh, whether it be in housing, where the Department of Justice, uh, sometimes by itself and sometimes in conjunction with housing and urban development, has gone after uh, fair housing settlements to make sure that people with disabilities have access to apartment complexes or other housing facilities that are open to the public and have announced a number of different settlements. And I would encourage everybody uh, to check out the websites of the agencies that we mentioned uh, here today, Department of Justice website. They have a very comprehensive list of the things that they have done and press releases and things of that nature. So you want to check those out and uh, the Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division over there has really been a, a jewel uh, of the administration in, in doing a fantastic job in, in looking at these uh, issues. Do you know, anything? Yeah, I would just add, so last summer was the um, 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, that was an important milestone, but at that point in time, the Department of Justice also updated its rules for, for the ADA. And you know, over time, there's been technological changes, changes in the construction industry, or, or just new, new understanding. So they um, you know, revised their rules to reflect current reality that, again, um, represent in many cases a step forward as, as far as expanding accessibility of, of, of public facilities. Yeah, it's a great point that, that uh, those rules impact, and I think it was over, um, Eight million businesses and uh, it, lots of pri lots of businesses and uh, facilities around the country, and there were new rules in that for uh, sporting facilities and and other entities that had not been covered before. Um, and I think that the rules had hadn't been updated since 1991 after the original ADA was passed. And uh, they did a really fantastic job. And uh, the president announced that at the uh, as Jeff said at the 20th anniversary of the ADA. So. Okay, why don't we take one from online? Um, we've gotten a lot of questions, so um, here's one from Sentient. Any chance of getting a person with a disability in the cabinet? There are a lot of us who are educated, passionate, and good people willing to serve our country. I think it would send a positive message to all countries, including our own. We actually do have a member of our cabinet as, as a person with a disability. Um, our, the Secretary of the Veterans Administration, uh, Secretary Shinsheki, is a person with a disability. Um, we also have, as Kareem mentioned, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Personnel Management, Christine Griffin, and a number of other high-ranking officials in the administration. You know, I think 
anything is possible. I don't see why we don't have multiple members in the cabinet. You know, I think I encourage everyone who is interested in being part of this administration to submit your resume to that email address I mentioned earlier. Make sure we get it. We will follow up with you. Um, you know, I, we also have the first or one of the first Supreme Court justices with a disability as well, uh, Justice Sotomayor. So, you know, we are, we are making huge gains as a community. Um, you know, and I would just say, as a community, we really do have the responsibility of maintaining a level of high expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and anything is possible. You know, I'm waiting to see the first openly person with a disability as president. You know, um, <laughs> hey, it can happen. Are you saying you're going to run for that? Or? Uh, I'm not making my <laughs> official announcement. Oh, okay. Right, I right. thought you were. Yeah, that's that's the the uh, <laughs> I'm on your exploratory <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from April in Middletown, Connecticut. When will the USA fully ratify the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Our leaders have spoken with disabilities, and it is time elected officials recognize the civil rights of such a large minority. Uh, thank you for the question, April. And um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has obviously have been very important to, to this president back from the uh, campaign, and he said that, the, that he would sign it. If he, if he became president. And six months into the administration, um, when you know, we started working on this, well, we started working on it right when, we, um, when the president took office. And you know, frankly, just to be frank, there, there had not much work had been done in terms of the agencies that needed to review the document and sign off on it and do all the legal things that you need to do to sign a convention. And so we put together an interagency group of some 20 to 30 agencies and we met on a regular basis and really uh, tasked those agencies with saying this was a priority for the president and we needed to get this done and so six months after we got here on the 19th anniversary of the ADA uh, the president announced that the United Nations would sign the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and uh, he did so. Oh, the, the, the president directed Ambassador Susan Rice to do so in July of 2009. And we became a signatory uh, to this important disabilities uh, convention. And since that time, we have been working extremely hard. Uh, the president remains committed to sending uh, the convention uh, to the Senate. And we've been working with the Department of State, Department of Justice, and many other agencies to put together a comprehensive ratification package uh, so that the Secretary of State, Secretary Clinton, can submit it to the President, and the President uh, can submit that to the Senate and urge swift ratification once it is uh, submitted to the Senate. So, so that process is ongoing. And we, uh, again, the President remains committed to submitting that document to the Senate. We are going to be submitting it to the Senate, this Congress, and we, we are working very hard uh, to get that package together. Uh, we know it's an important convention. We know that it's an important convention uh, for people with disabilities and veterans uh, who live abroad. And we know it's an important convention for business purposes, for American businesses who are abroad and people with disabilities who have businesses here in the States and do business abroad. And so uh, we remain committed to that convention. So thank you for the question. Okay, our next question comes from Randy in Arlington, Virginia. My mom is disabled and on SSDI, food stamps, Medicare, and Medicaid. I'm concerned about how debt negotiations in DC will impact her and poor disabled people like her. I fear the impact cuts to Social Security, food stamps, and health care will have on her ability to live and eat. What is the White House doing to prevent my mom from falling further into poverty as a result of debt reduction? So I'll start, and Kareem might want to add. So, you know, as we've said earlier, um, there are, the country is facing difficult economic challenges, and, and we have to deal with them. And the president's engaged in a dialogue with the with the Congress, and he believes that we must come up with a, a broad solution that will solve this problem in the short term and in the long term. There's been a lot reported in the press, though, about what's happening. Nothing is decided yet. So. We shouldn't presume that uh, major cuts are on their way or, or what that's going to mean. The president said he's willing to look at any issue and fairly um, assess those, but he really is looking for a balanced approach so we don't just shove all these cuts to um, low-income people, to people with disabilities, to people that depend on these programs. He's really trying to make them stable and secure over the long term. In the short term, though, recognizing we've had these challenges, um, you know, we've provided um, temporary assistance to, to people receiving Social Security benefits, including people um, on um, 
what people with disabilities that received a, a, a one-time check of $250 and taking other steps to, again, help people weather this, this current crisis. Uh, let me add, uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the events we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Jeff and I have uh, organized a, uh, several different events over the last uh, couple of weeks here at the White House, and I, and I hope people have seen some of the things, but, but many of you may not have seen it. And so I'm gonna, I'll tell you about them, and hopefully you can go take a look at them uh, on the website. Uh, this issue with Medicaid, and you, know, you, you see a lot about uh, Medicare, obviously, but the issue with Medicaid um, has become a little bit more public recently. And uh, again, what the president has said is that he simply opposes turning Medicaid into a dramatically underfunded block grant so that uh, tax cuts can be given to millionaires and billionaires and corporate jet owners. And I think that to illustrate that, that Medicaid is a program that is helping families all over the country, we wanted to illustrate that Medicaid is important uh, not only for helping children with disabilities become healthy, productive, active members of, soci of society who can be integrated into their classrooms, their parks, and across the country, uh, but what we wanted to show is that Medicaid and helping children with disabilities become independent and become productive members, it's also helping their parents who can go out and get jobs because of the assistance that Medicaid provides, whether it's getting a personal care attendant or other services, so that their parents can go out and get productive paying jobs and be tax paying members of society and not themselves have to go on uh, public assistance. And we brought in, uh, we worked with six different organizations to bring in stories from around the country. And we had people from Texas and we had folks from um, Michigan and we had folks from just many, several different states across the country. We did, I think, six events in total. And we had about two to three stories in each, uh, each event. And we had senior folks from the administration participate in each one of these events. Valerie Jarrett participated in an event. And uh, you all can be the first to know. You should go check out right now on whitehouse.gov. Valerie Jarrett just released a blog about uh, a few of the events this week. So you should go check out Valerie Jarrett's blog, uh, which should be up on the White House website. And so that's, you're all the first to hear that announcement. So go <laughs> check it out. Um, Valerie Jarrett participated in some of them. Uh, Melody Barnes, the director of the Domestic Policy Council, participated in the event. Uh, we had Phil Shalero, who is a uh, uh, special advisor to the president on special projects and the former head of the Office of Legislative Affairs. We had Nancy Ann DeParle, who is uh, deputy chief of staff to the president and works right under uh, Bill Daley. And we had uh, John Carson, who's the director of the Office of uh, Public Engagement. And, and other folks, and I'm probably forgetting, participating in the events. Of course, Jeff and I uh, participated in many, if not all, of those events. And, and so we heard the stories of families that are benefiting from Medicaid and that are really being able to uh, continue to lead productive lives because of Medicaid. And it's important for the president, he wants to hear those stories because he believes in the fact that this is helping real people every day be more productive, and it was important for him, for his senior team, who are in the room with him on a daily basis, advising him as he works on these budget negotiations, to hear these stories of Americans. So I encourage you to check out um, our blog. Valerie did the blog today. We had a blog last week from John Carson. It'll link you to some of the other organizations that we worked with and their stories. So check out those blogs, and you'll see how uh, the president is, is standing by Medicaid and standing up for Americans across the country. Um, our next question comes from Karen. She says, hello, will you please repeat the post of Rebecca's address? Great presentation, best regards, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca is a superstar. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, I want to be like you when I'm your talk. Um, my, uh, the best email address to send your information to is presidential, P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T-I-A-L, personnel, P-E-R-S-O-N-N-E-L, office, O-F-F-I-C-E, that's all one word, no spaces in between, at who.eop.gov. 
And we should say also that uh, this, this uh, video will be up on disability.gov, who's hosting the town hall today. We should have mentioned disability.gov earlier. Uh, disability.gov is hosting the town hall today, and so you should, it will be, uh, the video of this uh, town hall will be up on disability.gov later today, so you can watch it as many times as you would like and, and make sure you get all of the information. So check out disability.gov, which is really a fantastic resource uh, for finding out information about what's going on uh, in the government uh, related to people with disabilities. They cover all of the major uh, issue areas, education, health, employment, et cetera. So you can, you can go there uh, in addition to going to the uh, website. So disability.gov, uh, we certainly thank them for hosting uh, the event today and really doing all the groundwork uh, to put this together. And like them on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> and they did my... Uh, they did the tweeting I was, when we were in, uh, we just did a delegation to, uh, to Athens, Greece with Dr. Biden and, and we tweeted through disability.gov and of course I had no idea what I was doing but they, they walked me through it, so. <laughs> All right, let's take another one from online, live. Uh, this comes from Rose in York, Pennsylvania. She said, mental disabilities or the invisible disability are often ignored by the ADA. It is very difficult to prove discrimination against a person with a mental illness but the discrimination is real and prevalent. Um, and her question following that is, do you keep track of how many people with mental disabilities the government has hired? Well, I think w what we do is we keep track of uh, people with disabilities that are hired. I, I don't actually know for sure whether we keep track of every specific segment of disability. It's obviously voluntary whether people say that they have a disability. Um, and I know the, the, the forms do ask if people voluntarily want to um, state their disability. Uh, there are categories where a person can identify whether or not they have a specific type of disability. And so certainly hidden disabilities is something that we are absolutely aware of. Um, I'm sure Jeff will have something to add. Jeff does a lot of work in the mental health area, but, but, but we certainly um, have people with invisible disabilities who uh, work in the federal government. Uh, we have people with invisible disabilities who have been appointed. Uh, in the federal government. So it's certainly something uh, that we are aware of and certainly are committed to continuing to work on. And Jeff, you want to say anything about mental health? No, I mean, I think, I think you've covered it. I mean, there's okay. been a lot of excitement in recent years with uh, enactment and prior to the, this administration of mental health parity legislation. We think that's going to help um, in a number of ways. But um, clearly we have a lot, of, a lot to do. There, um, there's stigma with a lot of disabilities, but there's still a lot of stigma around um, people with, with mental illness, and we need, need to address that. And I think that across the government, from agencies like SAMHSA, but CMS that runs Medicaid and Medicare, there's lots of um, different agencies that are really doing a lot of really important work to help um, people with all kinds of disabilities, but including people with mental illness. Okay. Our next question comes from Beth in Parker, Colorado. Uh, diversity leadership programs typically overlook people with disabilities or they require a person to be at some kind of leadership level already when people with disabilities are just struggling to get in the door. What efforts are being made to help, to help us get to the next level past in the door? I'll take this one. Um, you know, I think the president and I know as an administration as a whole, we really want to see the federal government as the model employer for people with disabilities and see the federal, the private sector and the public sector reflect the need, the need and the really exciting things that we're doing. One of the things that we've been very excited about is um, with a, among our presidential appointees is the pro professional development that we've been providing. Um, we see this as critical for all appointees. And as a person with a disability in the administration, I know how critical it is for people with disabilities. Uh, we, so far and to date, we have had 80% of our political appointees participate in our professional development um, programs that we're running here out of the White House as part of our broader connectivity that we're working on with our appointees. Um, you know, we see this as you know, we'll of course not be satisfied till we get to 100%. Um, you know, and many of these folks have actually come through this academy in their first year. We see this as critical to give them the foundation that they need going forward. Um, we're hoping we start seeing it, you know, reflected more broadly in the private sector as well. You know, but like I said, this president operates off of an extremely broad definition of diversity. Um, you know, we're, we're finding folks from all over the country. We're actually going out and actively recruiting people at conferences. It's the first time that the uh, presidential personnel office has had a travel budget. Um, you know, previous administrations didn't have one. And so we're actually going out to find people where they are. 
because the president is telling us on a regular basis that he wants us to reach further, reach wider, reach deeper, and find folks that haven't had a seat at the table before and bring them here. Um, you know, but at the same time, we understand that it's no good bringing them to the table if they don't have the skills and the support and the resources that they need to be successful in their jobs. Great. The next one comes from Robert in New York City. The internet is always evolving. How will you ensure that people with disabilities are not left behind? That's a good question. I, um, myself, I am a computer user, as you might imagine, in this day and age, and certainly uh, I use the internet. And, I, and, I, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm blind. So uh, making sure that folks with disabilities are, are not left behind in the technological age is, is very important. And there, there are a number of things that we have done as an administration to address the overall technology field, uh, including the internet. And I'll just, I'll just touch on a few of those. We, uh, last year, the president signed the 21st Century Communications and, and Video Accessibility Act. And it was a, really an, an historic moment for, uh, for the president and for uh, the disability community. It was a civil rights piece of legislation related to technology, ensuring that, uh, that folks with disabilities have access to emerging technology, uh, whether it be 911 communications, uh, whether it be um, interactive TV sets, uh, whether it be uh, making sure that uh, folks who have uh, hearing disabilities or deaf or hard of hearing have the appropriate access that they need as well for closed captioning. So it was a very important piece of legislation and the president was proud to sign it and we had a great event here at the White House um, where the president invited a couple hundred of his closest friends from the disability community from across the country to come and uh, celebrate as he signed that piece of legislation. Uh, another thing that we've done, the Department of Justice has been uh, very aggressive in speaking about making sure uh, that we look at the issue of the ADA applying to websites. And uh, last year, uh, the Department of Justice issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking about this very issue. And uh, the Civil Rights Division, uh, Jeff and I have been working very hard with the Civil Rights Division, and the work is ongoing there. Uh, the next step is to get a notice of proposed rulemaking out about this very important issue. And we're working very hard, very closely with the Department of Justice that has been very, um, has been very supportive of this issue. And so uh, we plan to make sure that people with disabilities are, are not left behind in the, in the technology age. And, uh, the one other thing that I'll mention is that the FCC, in putting out its broadband plan, uh, I think it was last year, they put out their broadband plan, and I'll just note that there were a lot of sections in there that included uh, issues surrounding accessible technology in their plan, and, and, and Chairman um, Julius Janikowski has been doing a phenomenal job of including people with disabilities in the efforts of the, uh, of the FCC. Our next question comes from Natalie in Eureka, Missouri. Mr. President, I would like to know if we can bridge the two-year gap between disability approval and 24 months eligible for Medicare. I do not qualify for Medicaid, so this leaves me with no health insurance for two years. Thanks, Nat. Right. So this is a, a long-standing challenge in, in Medicare that you know you, you must determine to be disabled. Then, if you're under age 65, you have to wait um, 24 months um, from the point you're determined disabled. To, um, to, to receive Medicare benefits. You know, a lot of this, the President's worked really hard on health reform. He passed the Affordable Care Act. That's going to greatly help that situation because it's going to um, ensure in 2014 that all people have access to, to comprehensive health insurance. Many of these people will be able to buy um, private insurance through exchanges. Um, discrimination on the basis of disability, other uh, pre existing conditions will, will be outlawed. Getting there, though, we've already um, outlawed discrimination. We've already taken steps to expand in insurance coverage. But we've also, one of the immediate steps we've taken is launched the PISA program, the Pre-Existing Condition Insurance pr Program. And this is something that uh, provides um, relief to, to people there in every state of the country, but for some people um, can choose to purchase insurance um, coverage through these PISA programs as a way to bridge the gap until we have a more comprehensive solution in 2014. Okay. Um, this comes from Owen in Fallon, Nevada. Uh, what is the White House doing to encourage involvement of youth with disabilities in public policy and leadership opportunities? 
you know, I think one of the first things is, and, and I'm going to toot OPE's horn for a minute, is the youth roundtables that I know Cal. That's what I was going to talk about, yeah. Hey, I'm yeah. Say, yeah. Come in for a second. Um, have been doing. We've been actually really excited. I've heard from a number of young people actually around the country that have written me talking about their involvement yeah. in the youth roundtables. And I would encourage, you know, anybody really interested checking to check out um, whitehouse.gov slash young Americans um, to find out about those roundtables. Is that the right URL? Uh, well, I don't know the URL off the top of my head, but uh, if you go to whitehouse.gov, you, you can definitely find the Youth Roundtables uh, uh, link. But I, I myself participated in a couple of the Youth Roundtables as the White House uh, participant. Uh, one was dealing with uh, um, uh, general issues facing youth with disabilities, and there was one dealing with uh, mental health, and it was just a listening session uh, where we heard. And it was, it, it was great to hear from young people um, dealing with disability issues, whether they're young people who have siblings with, with disabilities or young people themselves with disabilities. And they had some uh, obviously profound thoughts about education and what needs to be done. And so uh, getting youth with disabilities involved uh, is certainly a part of what we're doing here. Some of the other things that we've done, we've had uh, youth participate in um, uh, grassroots events here at the White House. Um, we're doing these community leaders briefing series now. You should check out whitehouse.gov for information on that. But in that, we're bringing in community leaders from around the country uh, every Friday this summer. And many of those community leaders are youth, and we've had youth with disabilities be invited and will continue to be invited over the, next, over the, over the summer. And um, the one other program that I'll mention that we just, uh, that I was really proud to be a part of was the, um, we just had the graduation for uh, Project Search. Uh, which for those of you who may not know, Project Search is a, is a program that um, provides opportunities for persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities to work in a setting um, to finish their high school uh, education out and work in, a, in an integrated employment setting. And that's how they finished their education. And we hosted them in three agencies here, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Department of Labor, and Department of Education. And we just hosted the graduation for these high school students where Secretary Duncan spoke and, and I was able to participate as well. And so dealing with looking at those young people and some of those young people who graduated from that program, um, we went ahead and hired right away to integrated employment here in the federal government. So uh, it was definitely a success and we're gonna have, I think those three agencies are gonna continue to do it next year and I think we're gonna add one or two agencies that are gonna participate in that program and we hope to continue uh, growing it. I have one thing I'd really like to add. You know, I think generationally we've seen a generational shift in the disability community. Um, you know, I think through the development of state youth leadership forums, youth resource information and training centers, um, you, know, uh, you know, the growth of groups like People First and the, sort of the disability specific groups. Um, we've seen sort of a new generation emerge and, you know, Secretary Duncan refers to them as the ADA generation. Um, you know, they're the generation that grow up not only with the knowledge and, and sort of the experience of growing up under the ADA and IDEA, but they actually have the expectation mm -hmm. of employment. Yeah. They have the expectation of being homeowners. They have the expectation of, of not having to choose between having a family um, and working. You know, this, this, is, this is a huge generational shift in the disability community. Um, and I think it's been so empowering and so exciting to see the young, fo the, the next generation of leaders, and I hate calling them youth leaders because I, I find that very stigmatizing on, on a whole different <laughs> level. Um, but that's okay because you're young. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to, to, see these, to see this next generation of leadership come in and be engaged in policy discussions, we're actually even seeing it on the appointee level. We have some of the youngest presidential appointees in history are young people with disabilities serving at the behest of the President of the United States. And I do consider myself a youth, so <laughs> I'm a young person. Your, your hair belies a little They can't see that, I don't think, yeah. so. Okay, here's another question from a young person, and you did touch this on this a little bit with Project Search, but this one comes from Josh in Seattle, Washington. Uh, what is being done to increase access that young people with disabilities have to internships? Why aren't there pathways that make it easier for people employed as federal interns to get full-time jobs? They're actually, do you want me to take it? Go ahead. Um, we've actually had some conversations with our colleagues over at the Office of Personnel Management right now, and they're actually in the process of sort of rethinking and redesigning um, a number of federal internship programs to make them more aligned, to make them, you know, broader in terms of their reach. 
um, and to make them make more sense, and, you know, to be frank. And so we're act they're actually looking at how they can turn these programs into pipelines for employment within the federal government. You know, I think the other, you know, sort of the other th challenge is, is um, you know, cr in creating that expectation for employment, preparing young people for what they need to know, all young people, but especially young people with disabilities, for what they need to know to be effective going into an internship. You know, and I think there are a number of technical assistance providers that are funded by the federal government that have been developing materials on this. Um, I've seen a couple of guides come out related to like everything a young person with a disability needs to know to be effective in an internship 101. But then on the employer side, what do employers need to know in order to be effective and supportive of creating internships for students with disabilities? Yeah, and we've had, we've had a yeah. number of uh, interns uh, not only here in the White House with disabilities, but throughout the federal government. We were recently just kind of uh, taking a poll of interns with disabilities in various agencies. And uh, each agency came back and said, we have this many in our, in our department, whether it's in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services or Office of Disability Employment. Uh, Chris Griffin over at OPM has some interns with disabilities. And we have consistently had interns with disabilities in every White House internship class. And so um, we've had folks with deaf, we've had folks who uh, are blind, we've had folks with physical disabilities. And, and on and on and on. And so we're gonna continue that commitment here at the White House. Uh, we know our other agencies are gonna continue that. And like, like Becca said, they're working on uh, reforming um, the, uh, reshaping, reforming the internship program for the entire federal government. And, and people with disabilities are, are absolutely gonna be a part of that uh, because the folks over at OPM who are, who are really leading that effort, um, the leadership over there, John Barry and Chris Griffin, are absolutely committed to making sure that we include uh, folks with disabilities. And so um, the last thing I'll say is that we, it, the interns that we've had here, um, we work closely with the advocacy community and the organizations. We have interns from the AAPD internship program. We have interns from uh, WRP, the Workforce Recruitment Program. Uh, so we work closely with the uh, disability community uh, as well as folks with disabilities just applying not through any specific program or organization, just applying. So uh, we're, open, we're open for business. You know, and I would, the only thing I would add is I think it's also important that folks don't feel like they just have to work at a disability office. Absolutely. You know, if you want to work at the Center for Envi if you want to intern at the in Center for Environmental Quality or the, you know, the NSC or any of the other acronyms, please apply for those offices. Okay. You know, believe me, you don't want to come work for Cream and I. We're, we're pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> work for Jeff. Jeff's awesome. <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from Sharon in Beaufort, Missouri. Um, how is the new health care law going to affect us on Social Security disability, those who already have special problems and no money, um, along with state Medicaid? Will we have to start paying premiums for our insurance coverage? So um, the Affordable Care Act really shouldn't uh, produce major changes for people um, with disabilities that are already gaining coverage um, through, through Medicaid. Now states already have flexibility. They can charge um, co-payments for current beneficiaries, but it's limited. Um, um, acknowledging their, their low-income status. What the Affordable Care Act is doing is, is expanding access to Medicaid, expanding access to private insurance for all people and create new options, but it really shouldn't change sort of in general the, the terms of, and how you're, you're gaining coverage. So um, while a state could, under its Medicaid program, impose new cost sharing um, within current rules, there's nothing about the Affordable Care Act that's going to um, impose new, new premiums or cost sharing for, for people with disabilities currently in the program. Okay. Our next question comes from Olga in Miami, Florida. What plans are there on the federal level to help meet housing needs for people with disabilities? Well, you know, housing is obviously so incredibly critical. And uh, we thank you for the question, Olga. And a couple of things that, that we have done um, in the administration. The first is, the first that I'll mention is last year, uh, the president signed in the law the Frank Melville Housing, um, housing Act, and which really, uh, puts a stake in the ground about improving housing options uh, for folks with disabilities and doing it in an integrated setting and doing it in a setting where people with disabilities are living in the same buildings as people without disabilities and there's there's no sort of uh, segregation and so uh, that's one thing the other one the other thing that I'll mention is that um, we work very hard to look at this issue uh, in working with all of our agencies because we know that if you only focus on housing and you don't focus on 
health and you don't focus on civil rights, then what happens is you may have housing, but then folks are being discriminated against in other areas or they're not getting the health uh, benefits that they need through Medicare or Medicaid or, or whatever the services or the community-based services uh, that they need. So uh, the president launched the Year of Community Living in 2009, and even though it was called the Year of Community Living, it's ongoing. And the Department of Justice, HHS, and HUD have been working jointly very closely together. And Jeff and I talk to those folks, the leaders over there, all the time. And they're always collaborating on uh, whether it be housing choice vouchers uh, that Secretary Sebelius has worked very hard to release over 4,000 of those um, and putting millions and millions of dollars in new um, health slash housing initiatives. And so to work together has been critical. And then you add that with the Department of Justice's work on enforcing the Olmstead decision uh, to make sure folks have the choice to live in the communities where they choose and then you have a comprehensive effort overall uh, to focus on housing along with the other areas. You know, I would just say a couple things. One, um, and there was this question earlier about um, mental illness, So, um, and I'll get the ex actual name wrong, so I apologize, but there's a national action plan to end homelessness, you know, and if we look at the demographics of this population, there are a lot of people with disabilities who are homeless, including a lot of people with mental illness. And this is a really important strategic focus of, of HUD to, to make progress there. But the other thing is the specific programs at, at HUD, at Housing and Urban Development, that serve people with disabilities, are, are pretty small pieces in their broader portfolio of housing programs. And a focus of their work there is to ensure that all their bigger programs, the Section 8 program and others, are also assisting people with disabilities in, in housing. And you know, I would just like to echo what Kareem said. You know, um, because of the uh, connection between health and housing and access to long-term services and housing, we can't think of housing separate. And Department of Health and Human Services, our Office of Disability, and I think it's the Office of the Secretary at HUD, have been doing a lot of work together to really integrate the, these things and really make sure um, both federal programs work much better together. Okay, we have about three minutes left, so here's mm -hmm. our last question. Um, what training programs are available to HR managers and recruiters so they can ease onboarding for disabled employees? This one is a live question from Sukanya. Can you read it again? I'm yes. Sorry. What training programs are available to HR managers and recruiters so they can ease onboarding for disabled employees? Ease onboarding? Bring people on board. Bring people on board. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I would say, I assume we're talking about the federal government here, and there, there are lots of training programs, um, and the place to go for that is the Office of Personnel Management's website. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job of creating some tools. There's a Schedule A training that OPM has created for HR persons hiring, and then they've also created it for the consumer, the person with a disability, or is, who is trying to get the job. And they're quick five minute videos that almost demystify the idea of Schedule A and hiring people with disabilities because they make it really simple. And that's how it was designed to be, is really simple. And we've um, you know, kind of done a job as a government to make it more complicated. And so those training videos are on OPM's website. They have other tools that training personnel can use um, on OPM's website, as well as um, folks can always check out disability.gov uh, for other resources that are, that are available. And finally, I would say the Office of Disability Employment Policies website has created some toolkits regarding hiring people with disabilities and some other resources, so you can check out those websites. And the information is definitely there. Um, and I know Sarah said that was the last question, but I'm going to take a little bit of a um, <laughs> prerogative here because I want to address one final issue um, and certainly give Jeff and, and Becca a chance to have any final comments. But uh, there, there were, I don't know if maybe the most comments asked about the cost of living adjustment uh, related to Social Security payments and uh, when would that go up. And I just I wanted to clarify as how that works. Um, so I'll say two things about that. First of all, a couple of years ago, the president pushed for and Congress passed one-time $250 payments to Social Security uh, recipients across the country. And um, millions of folks got the one-time payment um, um, of $250 um, a couple of years ago. And then the President supported it again uh, last year, although it did not pass the Congress, but the President supported those one-time payments again to help out um, Social Security folks receiving different Social Security payments. The, the second thing that I would say is that on the cost of living adjustments, it is not a 
presidential decision on doing the COLA adjustment, what they call COLA adjustment, cost of living adjustment. It is an automatic formula based on inflation and some other things that I'm not a mathematician, so I can't figure out, but it is an automatic formula that determines whether there is a COLA uh, increase uh, for Social Security. And so that automatic formula dictates each year whether there's going to be a COLA increase or not. So it's not something that the president has said, I don't want to give COLA increases. And he's worked very hard to try to figure out other avenues to provide support uh, for those receiving Social Security payments. And so uh, I just wanted to make sure I address that. And of course, if we can give Jeff and Becca a chance to make any closing comments they'd yeah. like to make. Thank you, Kareem. I'll just be really quick. I mean, as we said sort of a couple of times, you know, the country's facing significant challenges. And President Obama is working really hard to get the country on a sound footing in the short term and in the long term. And um, it really takes all of us. The level of questions we got you know, just shows the, a high level of engagement from the disability community. And we, re we really appreciate that. I know all three of us, you know, we work really hard to, to make sure that um, all people with disabilities and all the various groups feel that they're fully engaged in partnership with us. And I just want to thank you for that and um, continue um, educating people as we talk about the role of Medicaid as we go through these policy dialogues about how different programs impact and benefit people with disabilities. So I just want to thank you for all of that. And uh, I, I think my website people would tell me, I, I need to say again, this is going to be up on disability.gov uh, later on today. So folks, you can forward it around, forward the link around, make sure all your friends see it. And um, look forward to receiving more information about what we're doing on disability. Becca? And I just, uh, to, to reiterate what my partners in crime had to say, you know, I really appreciate you guys joining us today. The unprecedented number and variety of questions we got. Um, you know, I think it's definitely reflective of sort of the diversity of experience that folks are, you know, dealing with out in America. Um, you know, and as we're, you know, as we're approaching the annual anniversary of the ADA, you know, I feel, I feel very excited and very comforted to think that, you know, this is probably the first administration where folks like the three of us would be sitting at the table together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, you know, we've, we've come a long way but we have a heck of a long way to go, you know? And we're glad to be here working for you guys um, out in the country and, you know, sharing your experience and, and using it to inform policy on a daily basis. All right, we thank Sarah for doing a great job thank with you, reading Sarah. the questions. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.